Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar. We're going to be talking about CWNP's new certifications for 2020 and give you some early insight into it. Product development is underway. The JTAs were completed last month, and that means that we're in the process now of getting everybody's schedule in place to build out the learning materials, the exams, and so forth. So we have an exciting year ahead of us. We have two new certifications this year, and we're also updating one. So I'm going to talk about all of that in this webinar today. Now, in addition, uh, as always, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be archived on CWNPTV, the YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, search for CWNPTV, all one word, and you'll find us there. So you can also find an entire history of webinars and other videos that are of learning use out there as well. Of course, you can find us on Twitter at CWNP and at Carpenter Tom is my handle. And uh, be glad to see you participating out there in the community. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to start by talking about why we are creating an IoT track. Now, we actually started this in 2019 with the launch of CWSA. This was the first one in a brand new track that is focused on the Internet of Things. And the focus is on the Internet of Things from a business and industrial perspective, from use in the business world, not necessarily IoT at home. Although, of course, if you know IoT well for the business world, you'll be well established for using it in the home as well. So we're going to talk about that. Then we'll talk about new certifications that are coming. And then we'll talk about the updated CWNA that's coming out this year as well. Okay, so why create an IoT track? Well, IoT is growing and we, well, to say it in a simple way, we ain't seen nothing yet. Um, there's been tremendous growth in IoT. IoT is so big right now that a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their minds around it. But IoT is probably about 20 to 25 percent of what it will be over the next four or five years. And so it's going to grow more in the next five years by far than it has in the last 10 or 12. And so it's very important for us as networking professionals, wireless professionals, to understand the use of wireless in the IoT space. So as you can see from this, this is the market size in billions of U.S. dollars. Uh, so it was $110 billion in 2017, $151 billion in 2018, and $212 billion in 2019. So it nearly doubled in market size from 2017 to 2019. It's expected to double again in the next two years. And then, as you can see, pretty much double again in the two years after that and then pretty much double again in the two years after that. So we're growing exponentially in our spend on IoT. But it's not just about what people are spending. We talk about IoT connected devices. We had in 2015 roughly 15 and a half billion IoT connected devices. Now, at the end of 2019, we had 26.66 billion IoT connected devices. So that's quite a significant growth. The current prediction is that by 2025, we'll have 75 billion IoT connected devices. Now, here's the interesting thing I want you to notice. Notice that the IoT spend is pretty much doubling every two years, but the IoT devices are not necessarily doubling every two years. Why would that be? Well, as people are implementing IoT devices, the realization is that the spend is more than the device. <laughs> um, we not only need the devices, we need the infrastructure for them to communicate across. We need subscriptions, services, cloud systems, local application servers, local databases, cloud databases. We need all of these different things to bring IoT together and make IoT work in the business world. And so because of that, the spend is going up at a rate faster than the number of devices deployed. So there are more things than just the hardware that we have to think about. And this will become very important as we see how organizations are benefiting from IoT as they're adopting and using it. So certainly, 
we're seeing a growth trend both in spend and in connected devices that is on a rapid upward growth. Now, if you can imagine in 2025, if we reach that 75 billion, and I personally don't see any reason why we wouldn't, the predictions a couple of years ago were that we would get to 25 billion by the end of 2019. Instead, we got to 26.66 billion. And predictions as recently as a few months ago had this tapered down that by 2023, we'd be somewhere in the 30s of billions. And uh, already they have moved that up with the expectancy of it being over 50 billion by 2023. Now I'm being conservative and saying we'll probably be somewhere between 35 and 40 billion at least by 2023. But if this prediction is right, then we're looking at over 50 billion by that point in time. As you can see by the trend, by the year 2030, if you want to think that far out, we will have well over 100 billion IoT devices. Now, to wrap your mind around that, remember, we got about 7 billion people on the planet. So, if you do the math, that's a few devices for each person, right? <laughs> so, that's about 14 plus devices for every person that exists on the planet. Now, obviously, these devices are not personal devices only. So we're not just talking about those. We're talking about industrial devices and so forth as well. We're talking about agricultural monitoring devices. We're talking about environmental monitoring devices. We're dealing here with self-driving cars or even assisted driving cars or just smart cars before we even get all of those. So all of these have IoT components within them. And therefore, you can expect this to grow. Some cars will have hundreds of different IoT sensors inside of them. And so one vehicle, hundreds of different devices. And then you'll have your roadside networks and all of the rest of this that comes into play. So realize these statistics are for connected devices. So what's not included here? Well, what's not included necessarily in all studies is, for example, the gateway that allows the IoT connected devices to connect. So if you figure we've got, let's say, 50 billion devices by somewhere between 2023 and 2025, then you've got 50 billion devices that need to connect. They're going to connect either directly to LTE 5G, or they're going to connect to a gateway that connects up to the cellular network, or they're going to connect to a gateway that connects to something else, but they're going to connect to something. So, so you've got to figure, if we're dealing with 50 billion connected devices, we're dealing with many millions of gateways that have to be deployed out there from all different vendors and <laughs> of many different protocols. So clearly, there is a huge market that's going to exist. Now, here's another interesting statistic in investment acceleration. So if we look at this, we see that when comparing 2017 to 2020, we see that in 2017, investment was at the peak for those that had increased investment by 11 to 50 percent, and that was 28 percent. But now, or rather that was, yes, that was 28 percent, but now that's 36 percent three years later. So 36 percent expect to increase their investment by between 11 and 50%. 15% expect to increase their investment by 51 to 100%. And 4% by more than 100%. And you can see, obviously, there are more people there than what we saw before. Now, there are, indeed, you can see some that are going to stay the same. But while 25% continued to invest the same as they did before in 2017, only 17% are continuing to invest the same in 2020. And while 2% were reducing their spending on IoT in 2017, only 1% is reducing their spending in 2020. So when you look at those numbers, you can see that these business decision makers are ready to spend on IoT. Now, here are the key things that we need to understand, because one of the things we have to do in all of our projects, we should be doing this on our wireless LAN projects, we should be doing this in our IoT projects, and that is we want to make sure that the business is getting the benefit that they desire.
And sometimes it's really hard to go back to the company and say, what are our business requirements? What are our business objectives? Why are we deploying IoT? So the benefit of knowing this kind of information is you can go there and ask questions. You know, do we want to do energy management within our factory? Do we want to assist in supply chain, chain management and logistics? Uh, do we want to improve customer service? You know, what's our big business driver? And as you can see, 38% data management and analysis. This is key for us at CWNP and why we've made some of the decisions that we've made about this IoT track. And you'll see that when we talk about the certifications in a moment. So data management analysis is the most cited benefit to the business function of IoT. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that to improve customer services and support, in at least some part, that also is dependent on the data we're receiving. And the same is true for all the rest. So the one thing that is consistent across all business function benefits is they need the data from the IoT devices. If you put a device out there and it's just sitting alone somewhere on a factory floor and no one ever monitors it, no one looks at the statistics, the data, then it really doesn't provide you any benefits, right? The whole benefit of IoT, Internet of Things, is that the data from the things is going to the Internet or at least to some server within the organization where it can be analyzed. And so when a person is getting involved in IoT deployment, when a person desires to become an IoT expert, they have to look at more than just the network connections. You have to think about the data. Now, also, we can see adopted or planned uses of IoT data. You'll notice that there are no plans to adopt in the next three years. So I always want to give you all the stats. No plans to adopt in the next three years for 15 or 16 percent of people for these different factors. But planning to adopt in the next three years, you can see 42, 43, 44, 51 and 51 percent for these five different factors already adopted between 33 and 43%. What are we talking about? Monitoring and optimizing performance of products or internal operations. So they wanna know how operations are going. Are they efficient? Are they effective? Is it performing well? Use of IoT data to inform operational decision-making. Again, going back to that IoT data to find out what we need to change, what we need to improve, how we can make manufacturing better, how we can improve safety, how we can increase sales, customer support, etc. Use of IoT data to inform strategic decision making. So sometimes we want that data so that we can change our strategic plans, not where the rubber meets the road, but our major objectives and goals and how they might need to change for the future. And then optimizing product or process design and predictive maintenance. So once again, these are the things that we can look at and say, these are the benefits that companies are getting out of IoT. These are the reasons they're using it. And you can ask which of those apply to my organization or the organization that I'm consulting for to make sure they get the best value out of their IoT implementations. And then finally, the last thing I want to give you as a statistical set of information before we get into the actual certifications is IoT security practices, because this is going to reveal why there's a security component of our IoT track. So notice that 5% just said, we don't use the IoT. Okay, so 5%, we don't use it. 95% were doing something with it. And how did they deal with security? Well, 8% said, our use of IoT presents no security issues. Either these people are very secure in their use of IoT, or they're naive. And they don't realize the security issues that might be presented. One of the two, I'm hoping they're very secure in their use of IoT. 25% said we rely on our technology providers to ensure the IoT equipment they provide is secure. Either one of two things is true here. Okay, there might be a third or fourth thing, but I'm giving you two options. So one of two things I'm going to say are true here. Either they've got a really great provider that they can fully trust and they don't need to do any inspection themselves, or they're naive about how much you should trust your provider. One of the two. 32% say we rely primarily on specialists' external advice to ensure our use of IoT is secure. 
Okay, this is, a, in my opinion, one of the better ones that we've seen so far, because this says we're at least having someone who knows IoT security evaluate our practices, evaluate what we're doing, and make sure that we're doing it in a secure way. And then 31% say we have the internal expertise and resources required to ensure our use of IoT is secure. So I think, really, that those last two, 63%, are probably the best option. That does, of course, leave us with 38% not necessarily in a good boat. Now, obviously, these are rounded, but 38% are not necessarily in a good place. And the other thing that is a danger is that 31% that has the internal expertise, we have to assume they're continuing to evolve their knowledge to make sure that they do maintain that expertise as well, because things change, new vulnerabilities are discovered, and we need to be able to protect against those. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what's going on in the world of IoT, just statistically, some things that we're seeing as trends in IoT growth. And about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I began to evaluate these numbers and determine for us at CWNP what we needed to do. So these are newer numbers. I was looking at other research back then, looking at trends, and I realized this thing's going to really explode in the decade ahead. And so we began the process of developing this IoT track, starting with CWSA. And the important thing to know is that there are going to be several certifications in this track that will ultimately lead to a CWSE. This is a solutions expert in the IoT space. Now, let's take a look at the two new certifications coming this year. The first one is the Certified Wireless Connectivity Professional, or CWCP. And I'll start by giving you the job description. This job description was created by the subject matter experts who participated in our job task analysis last month in Las Vegas. And the description is as follows. The certified wireless connectivity professional understands IoT connectivity standards and operation in business and industrial networks. This knowledge can be applied to deploy and troubleshoot the most common wireless IoT protocols with an in-depth understanding of their operations. A CWCP should be able to identify the technology and security requirements for a given IoT solution. Okay, so here's the way I would describe CWCP. Think layer one and two and a little bit of three. That doesn't mean that none of the other OSI model layers are involved. Doesn't mean that. But it means that that's where the primary focus of this certification ends up being. Layer one, two, and a little bit of layer three. Maybe even a moderate amount of layer three. But much less of layer four through seven. Because we're looking at the connection, hence the name, Connectivity Professional. It's about that IoT connection and specifically about wireless IoT connections. So when we say we're, we want to understand protocols, we're talking about protocols like Long Range, LoRa, L-O-R-A. We're talking about um, uh, protocols that are used to create that connection. And I'm not limiting it to LoRa, I'm just giving that example. Of course, the objectives, when they're released in their final state, will list the specific protocols that you want to make sure that you understand. So we need to understand how do those devices get a connection, maintain a connection, secure a connection, use a connection. These are the questions we need to be able to answer. And we need to be able to troubleshoot when the connections aren't working right, when data is not getting through, or something of that sort as well. And so that's what we're dealing with. So think between the IoT device and the gateway between the IoT device and the network. That's what we're focused on here, is that area predominantly. Now, again, you can't really talk about LoRa without talking about LoRaWAN. And so there will be some discussion in the learning materials and so forth about those other layers and how they work. But it's important to know the major focus of this certification. Get those IoT devices connected, secure those connections, and keep them connected. Now, let's look at the knowledge domains. So this gives you a breakdown of the topic areas that are covered in CWCP. First of all, we have wireless IoT technologies and solutions, which is 10% of the exam. Remember, our exams have 60 questions, so that means there would be six questions drawn from this knowledge domain. Okay, For every five percentage points, there are three questions. Wireless IoT RF characteristics. So you need to understand the RF characteristics specific to the frequencies used in IoT. 
which is mostly 2.4 gigahertz, 900 megahertz, 800 megahertz, 400 megahertz. Those are the most common uh, frequency bands used depending on where you're at in the world. Then we'll get into wireless IoT Phi structure and operations and wireless IoT Mac layer structure and operations. Again, look, layer one, layer two. Now there is wireless IoT upper layer protocols and it is 20% of the exam. But again, the primary focus, take a look here, 20% Mac layer, 20% Phi layer, 10% RF characteristics. That's 50% of the exam right there. And RF characteristics, that's, well, that's how the physical layer uses, I'm sorry, that is what the physical layer uses to get the data through, right? It's using RF. And so, therefore, that's part of layer one, you could say. And then IoT security. Well, there's going to be some upper layer and some Mac layer here, right? And then validate and troubleshoot IoT solutions, mostly going to be Phi and Mac with some upper layer. So in the end, you could safely say that 60 to 65% of the exam really ends up being layer one and layer two. So very important to understand that we're talking about that connection. And that is the primary focus of CWCP. So these are the knowledge domains. The final objectives will be coming out in the month of March. So you will be able to see those. They are in draft. And this next week, the subject matter experts that participated in the JTA will be reviewing feedback that I've gotten. Um, and then they will have a final pass over the objectives and make sure that they give us the quality that we need. And they are the objectives that we want to finalize for this exam. So you'll see those final objectives come out in March. So watch for announcements on Twitter and so forth when those objectives become available at the CWNP website. That is new certification number one. Number two is Certified Wireless Integration Professional, CWIP. Now, this is why I talked about how companies are using the data from IoT and why I showed you that to show that it's important for an IoT expert to understand more than just the wireless link, right? And so... Let's look at this job description. The certified wireless integration professional develops and implements solutions that integrate multiple wireless sourced management monitoring and control data through programming. This professional can identify and use the appropriate tools to extract, transform, and load data to and from wireless Internet of Things systems. The CWIP plays a crucial role in planning and delivering scalable solutions to automate the transport of and response to data throughout a heterogeneous network. Well, that was a mouthful. <laughs> this individual is the person you might say who's the layer three through seven person, mostly layer four through seven, but, but layer three through seven uh, as well. So they're not as concerned about layer one and layer two. Not that they won't need to know anything about layer one and layer two, but they're not as concerned about it. They're more focused on the upper layers. They're wanting to ensure that the data provided from IoT devices gets to the right place in the right way. Now, you can imagine some of the skills they're probably going to have to have, and let's take a look at them. Here are our knowledge domains. 20% explain and use integration protocols. Protocols that allow you to integrate data from multiple sources. I'll just give you an example of this. Uh, MQTT. OK, this is a common IoT protocol that is used at the upper layers, and it doesn't matter if it's Zigbee, if it's LoRa, if it's six low pan, if it's Z-Wave, it, it, it really doesn't matter what the lower layers are. You can use MQTT to send information from IoT devices to a message server, and then other devices can receive messages from that message server. So this is an example of an integration protocol because it gives you this aggregation point where data can be then forwarded out to where it needs to go on the network. Perform requirements analysis, 10% of this exam. Develop IoT integration solutions. What would be involved in develop IoT integration solutions? Well, this is going to be the big one because this is 40% of the exam. This is where you understand APIs like REST APIs and others. It's where you understand how to 
take data from one place and put it into another place, right? That's extract, transform, load, get data into a consistent, stable format so it's available. And then implement IoT integration solutions. So you build it. How, how do you implement it? How do you get it deployed in your organization? That's 15%. And finally, maintain and support IoT integration solutions, 10%. Now, if you take a look at any of the IoT frameworks that are out there, all of them deal with the reality of what this certification is about. And that is that you must get that data from your IoT devices to a useful state and in a useful place so that business analysts, decision support professionals, other people can look at that data, analyze that data, and make effective decisions. If you have devices monitoring your manufacturing plant, for example, and the plant manager cannot analyze that data to find out how to make recommendations for changes in the manufacturing process, it doesn't really provide nearly as much value. Hey, it's great if we're getting an alert because something's on fire, but it wouldn't it be nice to look at trend data and historical data and make sure that we understand how to improve the manufacturing process. And the same would be true for anything else that we're using IoT for. So this is CWIP. Now, you're probably wondering, when will these become available? So both CWCP and CWIP will launch as exams in September. Uh, there will be a beta of CWCP and CWIP, as well as the new CWNA, in July. But that beta will be a limited number beta, and it will be proctored. What that means is that the person taking the beta exam will actually be on a webcam and monitored while they're taking the exam to make sure they don't have any books or resources around them and things like that. Maybe you've taken a proctored exam in the past, but we'll be doing a proctored exam, which allows us to gather statistical information. It's called psychometric analysis. We gather this statistical information, kind of like this IoT data, and we use that data, that input, to make sure the exam is hitting its target. And so that'll happen in July. Final exam modifications and changes will happen in August, and it will go live in September. So um, that's that's important to know. So if you're interested in possibly a beta of CP, IP, or the new NA, then watch for that announcement when it goes out. The announcement of the beta will go out in uh, June, and then the actual beta will happen in July. So watch for that announcement. Uh, we're not collecting names at this point in time or anything like that. Just look for the announcement when that comes out. It'll be on Twitter and it'll be in our email newsletter. Finally, we have a new CWNA. Now, this is interesting. It, it really didn't dawn on me until we were in the middle of the job task analysis for CWNA last month that CWNA 108, the new version coming out this year, will be the 20th anniversary edition. Now, why is that? Well, it's going to release a little bit before the 20th year begins, but the very first CWNA exam ever taken was taken on November the 9th, 2001. And so, therefore, on November the 9th of this year, we will begin the 20th year of CWNA. And so, this, we're calling it the 20th anniversary edition. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's already been that long, but it has been. So let's take a look at the new CWNA 108 job description. The Certified Wireless Network Administrator understands standards and operations of 802.11 wireless networks. Responsibilities include deploying, managing, monitoring, and basic troubleshooting of these networks. The CWNA has the ability to describe devices and operations of current wireless LAN technologies. That's the job description. Now, the CWNA exam has no prerequisites, but we do recommend some knowledge and experience. Basic knowledge of networking, routers, switches, cabling, etc., and basic knowledge of TCP IP. And then at least one year of work experience with wireless LAN technologies. That's what we recommend. Can you, can you pass the CWNA exam without having a year of experience? You probably could, but it's easier if you've had the experience, right? You retain things better when you're actually experiencing the thing that you're learning about. Now, let's look at the knowledge domains for CWNA 108. They're the same knowledge domains that we had for CWNA 107, but you'll see the percentages have changed. So we still have RF technologies, 
regulations and standards, protocols and devices, network architecture and design concepts, network security, RF validation, and troubleshooting. And you will see that some of them stayed exactly the same. RF stayed the same. Protocols and devices stayed the same. Network security and RF validation stayed the same. However, you will notice that wireless LAN regulations and standards went from 10 to 20%. And actually, yeah, it's from 10 to 20%. And wireless LAN network architecture and design dropped by five percentage points, as did wireless LAN troubleshooting. Now, remember, CWAP is all about analyzing frames. And the reason we're doing it is in order to troubleshoot, right? So troubleshooting is the big focus of AP through wireless analysis. So we've dropped five percentage points there. And when I say we, I mean the subject matter experts in the JTA chose to do that. And then they've also dropped five percentage points from network architecture and design, which of course is CWDP. Security was already at 10%. And what that did is it allowed you to take the regulations and standards up to 20%. Now, Regulations and standards, don't think that's just knowing the names of these, okay? This is understanding uh, specific details within the standards. So it's very important to know that. Uh, and you'll see that when the objectives come out. Same thing for this. Objectives will come out in March for CWNA 108 in their final version. And so you'll be able to see those at that time. This exam will also launch in September. And we will have the first uh, CWNA 108 the first CWCP and first CWIP classes at the conference this year as well, by the way. So when you register for the Wireless Technology Forum 2020, um, you have the option to attend a pre-conference boot camp, and you could attend any of those three as well. So CWNA 108 will be the version of CWNA we present this year. We have CWNA there every year, but this will be the version 108. And we'll also have CWCP and CWIP. Also know that we'll still have CWSA this year. So that will run again, uh, the prerequisite to CWCP and CWIP. And we'll still be running our CWAP, CWDP, and CWSP classes. We will not be running our CWS or CWT classes this year. We have a lot of classes running, so we had to cut something. And so we'll be doing... CWNA, CWDP, CWSP, and CWAP, as well as CWSA, CWCP, and CWIP. And yes, two new certifications coming this year, and we're still not done. So there'll be at least one new certification next year, possibly two. We'll be deciding that, and it will be announced at the conference this year exactly what's going to happen there. And then in addition, for the first time next year, the in 2021, the CWSE certification will become available for those that hauled all of the lower certifications in the track. So good, exciting things coming. And we're very excited about this new IoT track because this new IoT track actually it has gotten a lot of attention from colleges and universities around the country. And the reason is because they need this knowledge and curriculum for their students. So the business world is saying to colleges, people are coming out of university with no understanding of IoT. We need them to have that. So they're looking to us and saying that this track we're building is the solution they've been looking for. So we're very excited to see that momentum and that enthusiasm. And we look forward to seeing the continued growth in that new track. I'm personally excited about it. I think the IoT space is a very exciting space. I've spent the last two and a half years of my life with a good 30 to 50% of my time for the first year or so invested in analyzing and researching in this area. And for the last year and a half, it's been about 50% of my time spent doing that. And so it has been a very exciting time looking at all of this. I think you're going to be thrilled by what you learn in this new track and in these new certifications. And of course, the new CWNA is going to be exciting as well. I should point out that uh, the question a lot of you might have is, are we uh, including 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 in CWNA 108? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay, so it is going to be in there. In the security section, you'll see coverage, though not as in-depth in CWSP, but you'll see coverage of WPA3, 
opportunistic wireless encryption, things like that will be in our learning materials. So you can expect those to be uh, added and updated as well.